Problems for cannabis began in the 1930s. In the wake of the Industrial Revolution, a new movement in America was born. It was called Chemergy, and it listed the very Henry Ford among its founders. Instead of abandoning agriculture to itself and directing all the investments toward the industry, this movement sought to transform and harness the agricultural output in order to integrate it into industrial production. The idea was to use agricultural products, mainly cannabis, to provide the industry with all the raw materials it needed. But there was a major handicap in making the production of cannabis truly competitive. The separation of the fiber from the stalk still needed to be done by hand, and this slowed down the production while greatly increasing the cost. But the invention of a new machine, the decorticator, seemed to remove the last barrier for cannabis, finally promising unlimited success. At that time, the magazine Popular Mechanics published a landmark article entitled New Billion Dollar Crop, in which it envisioned a tremendous revival of cannabis plantations all around the world. But not everyone seemed to be happy with the future success of this miracle plant. At that time, the magnet of pink journalism, William Randolph Hearst, had bought millions of acres of timber forests, which he intended to use to make paper for his ever more popular tabloid publications. With the return of hemp paper, far less expensive than tree paper, his empire was doomed to collapse in a short period of time. Another industry giant who was directly threatened by the return of cannabis was Lamont DuPont, the owner of the petrochemical company that had just bought the patents to create dozens of synthetic products from oil. Nylon stockings, brushes, men's clothing, and even tires for your car. And then Orlon, Dacron, synthetic sponges, cellophane, and a full range of products that would have been easily displaced on the market by their competitors made with hemp. Apart from the risk of losing millions of dollars, Hearst and DuPont had something else in common. They were both funded by one of the most powerful bankers of the time, Andrew Mellon. Andrew Mellon was also the owner of Gulf Oil, one of the so-called Seven Sisters. At that time, oil companies were expanding at great speed, but were likely to see their investments vanish by the mass production of cannabis, which offered a much cleaner and more economical fuel. Nor should we forget the young pharmaceutical industry, which was financed by two other powerful bankers, John Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. These people were conducting an all-out campaign to eliminate the accepted natural herbal treatments, including cannabis from the pharmacopoeia, while trying to replace them with drugs created in the laboratory. Furthermore, Rockefeller was also the owner of Standard Oil, which had already started to invade America with its refineries and its service stations. Thus was born this natural alliance between the synthetic textile industry, the oil industry, the producers of plastics and its derivatives, and the pharmaceutical industry. They all needed to get rid of the common enemy as soon as possible. Luckily for all, at that time, Andrew Mellon was also the Secretary of the Treasury. From that powerful position, he appointed his future son-in-law, Harry Anslinger, to be the head of the new Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Harry Anslinger had already had experience as a federal agent during Prohibition. His job was now to transform the crumbling bureaucracy of Prohibition, which in the meantime had been abolished, into a new weapon to combat and eradicate cannabis from the future of the nation. The Treasury Department intends to pursue a relentless warfare against the despicable dope peddling vulture who preys on the weakness of his fellow man. One, however, could not openly attack cannabis, which was a plant loved and respected by the vast majority. Hearst then had the brilliant idea to use the Mexican nickname marijuana, which was totally unknown to Americans at the time. In doing so, on one hand, he managed to divert the suspicions of the true objectives of the operation. On the other, by attaching the use of marijuana to blacks and Mexicans, it made it much easier to ride the growing wave of racism that was already sweeping across the country at the time. Adding fuel to the fire, Haslinger declared that marijuana is mostly used by Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana use. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with the Negroes, entertainers, and any others. 
The backlash was immediate, and soon a new green monster was born. The market was flooded with publications of all kinds in which marijuana, also known as reefer, became synonymous with sin, moral depravity, violence, recklessness, and even murder. From the most popular tabloids to adventure books, from comic strips to sophisticated magazines such as Cosmopolitan, all owned by Randolph Hearst, there was hardly a publication that didn't jump on the bandwagon of demonizing marijuana. Now that Puritan America had found its enemy, Anslinger felt it was time to extend the fear of contagion to the entire population. America is threatened by a new drug menace. Street corner vendors whose stock in trade is the deadly local weed marijuana pass it out in cigarette form. From ingeniously concealed containers, the reefers go to the waiting hands of deluded youngsters. Marijuana, the dried leaves and flowers of the Indian hemp weed, is used in the form of a cigarette. Marijuana smoking, experts point out, can make a helpless addict of its victim within weeks, causing physical and moral ruin and death. Yes, Let's go, Jack, I'm red hot. Every reefer is loaded with immorality and bestial perversions, brutality, murder, sex crimes, insanity, or suicide. Should you ever be confronted with the temptation of taking that first puff of a marijuana cigarette, don't do it. At the end of this devastatingly effective media campaign, a bill was introduced in Congress that in fact prohibited the cultivation and use of marijuana. Even though its psychotropic compounds are found only in the flower and leaf of cannabis, Aslinger was able to have the entire cultivation of the plant prohibited all across the country. Most of the representatives and senators who voted on the bill, in fact, didn't even know that cannabis and marijuana were the same thing. At that time, congressmen voting uh, on this piece of legislation were not aware that marijuana was hemp cannabis hemp that that country had been using profitably for centuries. Without public debate and without the support of scientific research, in 1937 the Marijuana Tax Act was approved by President Roosevelt. The war on cannabis had officially begun. There were dozens of glamorous arrests, which the same Hearst immediately made known to the entire nation. But not everyone believed in the demonic dangers of marijuana. The popular mayor of New York City, Fiorello LaGuardia, commissioned a scientific investigation to ascertain the real effects of marijuana on the user. 31 independent scientists worked for over five years, completing what became the first known scientific study on the use of marijuana. Published in 1944, the LaGuardia report showed surprising results. Marijuana, it said, does not cause aggressive or antisocial behavior, does not cause an increase in sexual depravity, does not alter the fundamental aspects of personality. Furious, Anslinger immediately resorted to the press to discredit the research, then unleashed his agents all over the country with the task of destroying every copy of the report they could find. Still not satisfied, Anslinger steered the media propaganda so that the casual smoker of marijuana became associated with the users of hard drugs such as heroin, cocaine, or morphine. It is a symbol, a symbol of narcotic addiction is poisoning the blood of our country. But it occurs when the addict is deprived of his narcotic. He is experiencing withdrawal symptoms. He lives from fix to fix. The addict must have his drug, and to get it he must have money, and that much money comes hard. Marijuana is also smoked. Marijuana is the most prevalent narcotic among juveniles. Its greatest danger lies in the fact that it is a stepping stone to the harder drugs, such as morphine and heroin. 95% of narcotic addicts begin with the use of marijuana. 
Based on this myth, which has never been confirmed by scientific research, the marijuana user was equated with the figure of the pathetic drug addict, the social reject, the loser who no longer had a chance of recovery. Building on this misinformation campaign, Anslinger convinced Congress to enact new laws which provided that the smoker of marijuana would suffer the same penalties as that of hard drug users such as cocaine or heroin. In 1956, the first arrest for possession of marijuana carried a mandatory sentence of two to ten years in prison. In some states like Missouri, a second arrest for marijuana possession could be punished with life behind bars. Now that America was under control, Anslinger turned his attention to the rest of the world, where cannabis was still being cultivated freely. At the United Nations, Anslinger began knitting a Machiavellian web of diplomacy based on the growing power the United States could now exert over other nations. In 1961, Anslinger culminated his career by persuading the UN to unify all single existing treaties on drug control. Thus was born the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, to which more than 150 countries adhered. The convention established an international tribunal for the control of drugs and committed individual states, among other things, to combat and eradicate as soon as possible the cultivation of cannabis. Within a few years, the production of cannabis would become illegal virtually everywhere in the world. The petrochemical industry had won its battle, while the world received, in exchange, the huge ecological disaster we are witnessing today. Air pollution, the contamination of aquifers, rivers, and the seabed, wild deforestation, extinction of animal species, global warming, and most importantly, our slavery to oil, which could be erased at any time by simply going back to cannabis as the basis for all fuel production. A hundred years ago, the farmer produced all of the fiber, all of the medicine, all of the fuel, and all of the food that this society consumed. That's what farming is. You raise those four basic categories, fiber, food, medicine, and fuel, and you sell them in the cities that are the basic necessities of life. The money flows out of the cities back to the landowner and to the producer, where land is the means of production of wealth. It's been that way for thousands of years. Today, a hundred years later, the farmer doesn't produce any fiber. If they do, it's cotton, which accounts for 50% of the pesticides and herbicides used in the agricultural sector. The farmer doesn't raise any medicine. It's all been monopolized by the pharmaceutical companies. The farmer doesn't raise any fuel. It's all been monopolized by the petrochemical companies. And if you go into a grocery store and look at the ingredients on package, you'll find out how rapidly the farmer is being displaced from their heritage of food production. It's all been taken over by the synthetic manufacturers who, in producing these synthetic products, create the toxic waste and the hazardous byproducts with which we're having such a tough time dealing. And not only that, it concentrates wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer people all the time because the means of production of wealth is no longer the land. It is now the factories and the shareholders and the people who own the, uh, the controlling interest in those corporations.